We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 this morning. And if you read my email on Friday, and if you read all the way through, you know that we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 16. If you didn't get that, it's like I said earlier, either emails from the church are hitting your junk folder, go in and whitelist ccwichita.org, and that'll correct that. Or maybe you're not in our directory. You can see me, your Pastor Rob, and we'll help you correct that. 2 Corinthians 9. Eventually, we're going to start 1 Corinthians 16. And in both of those chapters, Paul continues his discussion of giving. The discussion, the conversation, the exhortation that he began two weeks ago, three weeks ago really, in chapter 8. If, if this was a meeting instead of a letter, at the end of chapter 7, Paul would have said, well, that concludes our old business. Let's turn to new business. And the first item on the agenda under new business is giving. He finished old business at the end of chapter 7. Okay, we've, we've talked through what we needed to talk through about the stuff that happened between us. The relational stuff, the theological stuff. We're done with the old business. Let's talk about new business, chapters 8 and 9, the first item on the agenda, giving. It's our third week in this section which means for some of you, it's the third week that you've been wondering, when are we going to talk about tithing, Patrick? Because when the subject of giving comes up in Christian circles, that's the discussion that inevitably seems to follow. Or should I say that's the argument that generally seems to ensue. Is tithing a New Testament concept? Is it something that you and I as Christ followers are obligated to participate in? It's something that Israel was obligated to do. God required Israel to tithe. He commanded them to tithe. If you're not familiar with the term tithe or tithing, by the way, not a big thing. Basic concept is simple. Under Jewish law, Mosaic law, the rules for living given by God to Moses as the children of Israel fled Egypt, the first fruits of all production belonged to the Lord. Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, a couple chapters if you want to read up on this. But the first fruits belonged to the Lord. Literally, the first fruits, Israel was an agricultural society. So the first fruits of the harvest, the first tenth of each harvest, was given to the Lord. Ten percent of every flock, every litter, lambs, cattle that, that were born, calves, were to be offered at the tabernacle, later the temple. And if income was obtained any other way, tithing was understood to also include ten percent of those revenues. Now, Old Testament students here, you're raising your hand. I can see you. There was more than one tithe. There's a tithe for the Levites, the priestly family, and there was a, a tithe for the temple, and there was a tithe for the feasts, and there was a tithe for the poor. And when all was said and done, that was way more than 10%, Patrick. It was more like 23 and a third percent. And that's true. You're right. Well, let's keep it simple this morning. I don't know why. I got an extra hour of sleep, and I think I'm fuzzier than if I hadn't. I don't know how that works. Yeah, yes, there were multiple tithes under Mosaic law, but when most people in the church talk about the tithe, they're referring to the tenth. They're talking about the 10%. And when Christians argue about the tithe, they're not arguing 10% versus 23 and a third percent. They're arguing, is tithing even something we should concern ourselves about at all? Is it something relevant to us as Christ followers? We're going to explore this this morning, and the six points of our outline, if you're taking notes, you can jot these, these six points down. No, yes, maybe, why, wow, and what now? No, there are some who say tithing is not for the church. Yes, there are those who say it very much is something for the church. Third point, maybe they're both trying too hard. 
Fourth point, why are they trying at all when Paul talks about giving? Wow, I think we've been missing the whole idea. And what now? The way we end every study. No, let's, let's start there. Many pastors, writers, authors, commentators say no, Christians are not obligated to tithe. For the simple reason, tithing was a requirement under the law. And Matthew 5.17 tells us, Christ came to do what? Fulfill the law. And and, and so in 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 their view, this is quite simple. The mandate doesn't apply to us because Christ fulfilled the law. It has nothing more to do with us than Jewish dietary restrictions. I can enjoy a cheeseburger. I can have milk and meat in the same meal because I'm not under the law. And in much the same way, I'm not required to tithe. I'm not under the law. Paul wrote to the Galatians. We studied this last year. You're not under the law. Christ freed you from the law. Don't let anyone put you back under the law. And when the Judaizers tried to argue the point... When they said Christians need to observe the law, and if Gentiles want to become Christians, they have to first become Jewish and put themselves under the law, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, under the leadership of the Apostle James, said no, no they don't. They said, hey, stay away from things associated with pagan worship. Avoid the food that people associate with idol worship and the sexual immorality that often goes with idol worship. But even that wasn't about the law. That was about not stumbling weaker brothers. Because Jesus fulfilled the law, and today we walk in that liberty. That's the no perspective. Now, point number two, the counter-argument offered by some, some who say yes, including some teachers that I respect a great deal, will argue some of the things codified by the law, some of what was written down and given to Moses on Mount Sinai, some of those things actually predate the law. They were already there. They were already present. They were already in effect. They were just written down when the law was given. They weren't new. Can you give me an example, Patrick? Sure, the easiest example is the difference between clean and unclean animals. God, in Genesis 7, told Noah, bring how many animals onto the ark? In Sunday, yeah, exactly. In Sunday school, we learn two by two. But when we open Genesis 7, we read seven of every clean, two of every unclean. Clean animals are the animals that chew their cud and have split hooves. So that's what? Deer, cattle, goats, sheep. Unclean animals would include pigs, dogs, horses. Similar division of of birds. Chickens are clean, owls are unclean. Similar division of fish, grouper, are clean, catfish, unclean. But the point is, how did Noah know? Those instructions, we know these things because we read them in the law. That distinction, those, dis- th- th- those delineations were given as part of the law, but the law hadn't been given yet. Abraham wouldn't even be born for at least 200 years. And yet the concept already existed. And Noah was expected to know it and understand it and observe it. So the idea of clean and unclean, that idea that appears in the law, actually predates the law. Patrick, can you give me another example? Sure, blood sacrifice. Given great detail in the law, right? Lots of space in the law devoted to blood sacrifice, but we see animal sacrifice to God as early as Genesis 4. Cain and Abel. So it's along the same lines, goes the argument, that tithing is another practice described in the law that actually predates the law. How so? Genesis 14, Abraham tithes to Melchizedek. 800 years before Moses climbed Mount Sinai. So maybe, 
goes the argument. Maybe tithing isn't a function of the law. Maybe it's transcendent. Maybe it's a divine universal standard. That's one of the authors who says, yes, Christians should tithe. Maybe. Or maybe, point number three, maybe it isn't. Maybe those who are working hard to defend Christian tithing are trying too hard. Because, consider this, just because something existed before the law doesn't mean it automatically continues after. The Sabbath predates the law, right? Genesis 1, it's hardwired into the fabric of the universe. On the seventh day, God rested. The Sabbath predates the law, but Galatians 4, and and, and, and lots of places, Colossians, Romans, lots of places, but we study Galatians together says that we are not required to observe the Sabbath. Why? Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Sacrifices, yeah, sacrifices existed. But all of the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 10, tell us that animal sacrifices today have ceased. Why? Jesus was offered once for all. He satisfied God's justice. There's no longer a need for the blood of sheep and goats and cattle to cover our sin. Our sin has been erased. Just because something existed before the law doesn't mean it automatically continues. Doesn't mean, by definition, it still applies to you and I who are no longer under the law. Here's another problem for those who argue tithing transcends the law. Tithing was a command. It was an instruction. It was an obligation. Nowhere do we read that God commanded Abraham to tithe to Melchizedek. It seems to be something that Abraham freely, spontaneously chose to do. He just did it. And he did it how often? Only one time that scripture records. Never again do we read of him tithing to Melchizedek. Never again do we read of him tithing to anyone. In fact, nowhere before the law is given do we read of anybody tithing. Except Jacob one time in Genesis 28. And that was clearly, even more clearly than Abraham, clearly a free will offering. Not a commandment not a requirement. But why are we even arguing about this? Fourth point, why are we reaching back to the Old Testament for guidance when Paul has given us pretty comprehensive instruction concerning giving? Instruction that begins back in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 1, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the church of Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I also go, then they'll go with me. We skipped over this as we were finishing up 1 Corinthians because we said it's going to fit better when we get to 2 Corinthians 9, and here we are, so here we go. In just four verses, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, Paul tells us most of what we need to know as New Testament believers about giving. Six things that he tells us, we're going to use the letter P to keep them straight, Six things that he tells us. The first is that giving is to be personal. Verse 2, he says it's the responsibility of every believer. Doesn't mention giving in terms of tithing, not a requirement, not a commandment, but he acknowledges that as an expectation. He describes it as an opportunity every believer has. Each of you, personally, 
individually, each of you, verse 2, lay something aside. Paul's expecting that everyone's going to do this, that everyone will personally participate in supporting God's work through the church. When? Still verse 2, on the first day of the week. As part of your Sunday worship. We think of the first day of the week as Monday, because that's when we go back to work. But the first day of the week is, is today. It's Sunday. On the first day of the week, as part of your worship service, give. What he's saying is that giving should be planned. P for plan. Don't wait for somebody to ask. Don't wait for, for guilt or pressure or, 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 or an elbow on the side to, to prompt you. Just do it. Systematically, consistently, give to the Lord's work. Personal, planned, how much? Still verse 2, storing up as he may prosper. What does that mean? It means proportionately. This is the same idea we talked about last week. If you have a lot, you get to give a lot. If you don't have as much, you won't give as much. Give, Paul says, proportionately, in proportion to what you have. And this is, this is where, where some Christians say, well, okay, I get that tithing isn't a thing, but I think 10% is still a good benchmark. Okay, if, 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 if that's your conviction. That, that would be a way to establish proportionality. Paul goes on to say that giving should be done properly with, with accountability, verse 3. Again, something that we talked about last week. They'll go with me, Paul says. I'm not going to be with the money alone. And lurking in these verses is also something that Jesus taught us, which is that giving should be done privately. I think that's part of what Paul intends when he says, no collections when I'm there. He means a couple things, but I think one of them is, I don't want to see what people give. I don't want to know that. The left hand shouldn't know what the right hand is doing. I don't need visibility of that. It's between you and the Lord. And if we flip over now to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's going to add one more thing to our list. 2 Corinthians 9, we're going to read that giving is a privilege. Verse 1, concerning the ministering to the saints, see it starts the same way that he started in 1 Corinthians 16, right? Concerning the ministering to the states, it's superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, the, the southern region of Greece. And your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I've sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Paul's in Macedonia as he's writing this. He's saying, look, it's likely, more than likely, that when I come to see you, there'll be some Macedonians with me. They're going to want to come. And you don't want to be embarrassed if the thing that <coughs> we talked about a year ago, you're not ready to follow through, through on. Verse 5, therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you'd previously promised that it might be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Paul is saying, look, I'm sending Titus and the other two brothers, the guys that we read about last week, I'm sending them to you, not to put the squeeze on you, not to lord over you, not to put some guilt or obligation upon you, but to remind you of what you used to know, to remind you of the commitment that, that, that sprang up spontaneously from you a year ago. I want them to get to you with enough time that if they have to, they can reteach you about these things. Because, look down at verse 7, Paul says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, not out of guilt or obligation, for God loves a cheerful giver. Another word for cheerful, joyful. Another way of expressing what Paul is saying. God loves a spirit-filled giver, a giver who's giving through the overflow of God's work in his heart. Again, Paul reminds us, Giving is not a got to. He's not reteaching 
tithing. He's not reinstituting an obligation. It's not a got to, it's a get to, it's an opportunity. And my personal conviction, you can disagree with me on this. My personal takeaway from what Paul just told us is that 10% is probably a minimum for most believers. How do you get there, Patrick? If, if the law sets 10% as the bar for those who are giving out of duty and obligation, surely you and I, abounding in Christ's love, being, being filled with his spirit, seeing giving as a privilege, surely that's just a place to start. You can disagree about that. What you can't disagree about, Paul just told us giving is a privilege. But we already knew that, didn't we? Giving should be personal, planned, proportional, properly done, private. Yeah, those first five might have reminded us of some things that, that we forgot or clarified some things that were fuzzy. Personal, planned, proportional proper, private, but privilege? That one we already knew. Because what did we read two weeks ago? Scroll back to chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. What did we just read? We read our verse from two weeks ago, Patrick, you said that. If that's all you took away, read it again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ... Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. That's the wow part, number five on our outline. Wow. That's the story of our redemption, isn't it? A story that's beautiful and horrible at the same time. Simple and elaborate simultaneously. Both elegant and brutal. That's the story of the cross. And I'm not sure I did a great job of making that point two weeks ago. We read it. And we paused and we talked about it. And then we kept moving. And what I heard from more than two people is that maybe I kept moving a little too quickly. One sister who I respect deeply rolled up on me and she said, you dropped a bomb on us, Patrick, and then you just kept going. Sister that I love and that I respect said, yay, that was a hit and run. <laughs> and she was talking specifically about the part where I was underlining what Paul said at the very end there of verse 9, though he was rich, yet for your sakes for our sake, became poor. I pointed out that part of what Paul meant, not everything he meant, but part of what he meant, was that Jesus exited eternity, stepped down from his throne, said goodbye to the angels, I'll see you in a while, and became human. And he did that so that he could die. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 17 is on a different page. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Jesus had to be made like us, had to become like us. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, priest who offered sacrifices in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to become a sacrifice sufficient to pay for our sin. He had to take on a form 
that could die. It was the only way we were going to be saved. It was the only way sinners like us, and that's all of us, right? We're not confused on that? It was the only way sinners like us could ever be forgiven. The wages of sin is death, Scripture says. Which means either we had to die for our sin or someone else had to die in our place. God couldn't just wink and pretend sin didn't happen. He's perfectly just. That's part of what it is to be God. That's one of his attributes. He is perfectly always just. And in his justice, someone had to pay for what we did. Someone had to be punished for our rebellion against our creator. Someone had to die. And if that death was going to be sufficient for 20 billion people, rough estimate of the number of people who have lived and are alive today and will live, if that death was going to be sufficient for 20 billion souls, it had to be someone who could die 20 billion times over. Jesus became poor. He became a man. He impoverished himself, set aside riches and privileges so he could be that someone. And he's the only one who could. He's the only one who could become man so that he could die and simultaneously remain God so he could suffer 20 billion eternities in hell. That's the part that takes my breath away. Every time I think about that, and I think about it a lot, maybe because I read science fiction and I, 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 I watch science fiction movies sometimes, periodically you, you, you come across the idea of a time warp. And it's based on Einstein's relativity theory that, that if you're flying in a rocket ship at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light, then you could be a few weeks in your spaceship rocketing along at these amazing speeds. And for you, only a few weeks go by. But if you circle back and come back to the Earth, you might find that a few centuries have gone by. That's what happened on the cross, except it wasn't science fiction. It was eternal fact. Because when Scripture says the wages of sin is death, it's not death like, bang, you're dead. You were living, now you're not. No, when Scripture says the wages of sin is death, it's talking about eternal death. Forever death. Never-ending, living death. Unending torment. Somehow, don't ask me how, but somehow... In, in remaining fully God, even as he became fully man, somehow in those six hours that he hung on the cross, Jesus was able to spend 20 billion forevers in hell. 20 billion forevers he didn't deserve in isolation, in darkness, in torment. For us. But that's not the end of the story. And here's the part that laid some of you out. This is the part that people said, okay, that was a hit and run, and please, you got to circle back, okay? Jesus not only became poor so we could become rich, rich in the sense of inheritance, we're joint heirs in Christ, everything he owns, we now own, rich in the sense of adoption. God has adopted us into his family, rich in the sense of eternity, in God's presence where there's fullness of joy, richness in unity, forever the bride of Christ. Jesus not only became poor so that we could become rich, he remains poor. Had to become a man to die in our place, but when he rose, he was still a man. When he ascended, he was still a man. When he returns, he's going to return as a man. Can you give me a verse that says that? A couple people asked me. Sure, here's one. 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. Just, just listen. Paul says, There is, present tense right now, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. There is today a mediator, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself in the past a ransom for all. Paul tells Timothy, Jesus gave himself in the past, and because he did, he is today, right now, a man in the present and in the future and forever. Today there's a man seated at the, seated at the right end of the Father. And because he's a man, Scripture at least suggests there are things he may not know. His omniscience may be constrained. Acts 1 7. He tells the disciples, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has reserved under his own authority. Because he's a man, there are definitely things that he cannot do. His omnipresence is curtailed. Jesus cannot be in more than one place at a time. That's why he told the disciples in John 16, it's good that I go away, because if I go away, the Holy Spirit can come. It's good that I go away because I could only be one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit can indwell you and be everywhere that you are all of the time. I can only be in one place at one time, but the Holy Spirit can be everywhere the church is. Because he's a man, there may be, I'm not dogmatic about this, but there may be things that Jesus doesn't know. There are things he cannot do. And listen, there are also things, because he's a man, there are things Jesus cannot change. Though the heavens fade away, don't leave me hanging, all your scars still remain, and forever they will say how much you love me. For all of eternity, the body of the man Christ Jesus will bear the marks of his crucifixion. Hands and feet we know for sure. Because Thomas put his dirty old thumbs in the holes. His face, we suspect. Why didn't the disciples recognize him? Is it possible because he was so scarred from his beard being pulled out. The wound in his side, the wounds in his skull from the thorns, the wounds in his back from the whip. When the heavens pass away, when, when God rolls up creation like a scroll, and brings the new heaven and the new earth into existence, Jesus will still be a man. His scars will still remain. And what's our response? This is the what now. Last part on the outline. How does the song continue? Forever my love, forever my heart, Forever my life is yours. Why do we give to support Christ's ongoing ministry through the church? Because that's what we do when we give, right? Jesus commissioned us to continue his work. He said, I'm leaving, but the Holy Spirit is coming. And he's going to be indwelling you, and he's going to be empowering you and anointing you, and he's going to be leading you out so that you can continue what I began. He's going to empower you to go out and preach the gospel to every living creature. He's going to anoint you to make disciples of all the nations, to teach people not just to believe in me, but to follow me. We get to be a part of that, not just spiritually with our prayer, not just practically with our service, but financially, with our checkbook. Not out of guilt or obligation, Paul is saying, again and again he's saying. Not because it's a commandment or a requirement, but out of gratitude. 
as an act of worship, again, on the first day, as part of your worship, as an acknowledgement that everything that we have, Jesus purchased. He redeemed us and out of his grace, he gave it back to us and said, use it, use it for my glory. Our giving is a response to his sacrifice. We love him because he first loved us. We give to him because he first gave to us. God is a giver. That's another part of what it is to be God, another one of his attributes. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 10, 17, Jesus says, no one takes my life. You don't have that power. I'm giving it. No one takes my life. I'm laying it down for my friends. And I don't think any of us can entirely comprehend exactly what that means. I'm not sure we'll fully grasp it even in eternity. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. It's another one, right? You might not recognize it because I sing it not well, but... But how does that song start? King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Oh, that's where that comes from. And again, what's our response? Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Chapter 8, verse 7, one verse above where we've been, Paul talks about spiritual graces. That's an interesting phrase. We're more used to hearing about spiritual disciplines. Paul turns it around. He says, think in terms of spiritual graces. What does that mean? What is grace? Grace is undeserved favor. What is he saying? When he talks about faith and speech and knowledge and diligence and love and giving, he's talking about things we don't deserve to be able to do. But because of God's grace, we get to do. We get to trust God. We get to share the gospel. We get to learn the Bible. We get to serve in ministry. We get to love our enemies. And yeah, we get to give to our church family all of it as worship. We'll never know what it cost, but we know that it cost, and we know that we're rich because of it. So here we are to worship, and if we have a hard time with that, if we struggle with any of those graces, if we, if we have a hard time worshiping in any of those ways, it's probably because we haven't thought about the cross enough lately. Because when we do, when we not only think about it, but meditate on it, immerse ourselves in it, marinate in it, when we truly consider the cross, when we survey the wondrous cross, I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. But when we do, when we survey the wondrous cross, worship has to happen. Worship has to happen. And not just the worship as we lift our hearts and our hands and our voices to heaven, but the worship of our time, the worship of our talent, the worship of our treasure being made available. 
So let's take some time to do that now. Let's pause and survey the wondrous cross. Plan the service this morning so we wouldn't be rushed. Hector's going to come up. He's going to give you a break from my singing. But let's take a few minutes and consider, consider the cross. Let's take a few minutes to remember the gospel. And let's take this time to ponder the cost. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turned His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him dear Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life And I know that it is finished Boasting anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart That His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. That his wounds have paid my ransom. But this I know with all my heart That His wounds have paid my ransom
And when we know that with all of our heart, when we remember that with all of our heart, when that truth fills our hearts, what overflows is worship. What overflows is love and prayer and truth and service and giving. Ushers in a moment are going to distribute the bread and the cup as we celebrate communion. They didn't miss their cue. I asked them to hold off because I didn't want to multitask this morning. I didn't want even that small distraction to compete with the lyrics of that song. But, but having allowed that truth to hopefully fill our hearts, let's gaze upon the bread and the cup, the, the ordinance, the symbols that Jesus gave us. Hang on to them as, as the ushers distribute the elements and we'll partake together. I received from the Lord, Paul writes, that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take this, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It took me an embarrassingly long, embarrassingly long time to recognize that's prophecy. Funny that a guy that enjoys prophecy as much as I do would miss that. But Jesus is prophesying. He's saying, I'm giving this to you, and I'm telling you that 2,000 years from now, you're still going to be doing it. And he gave us this out of his grace. He gave us this because he's sympathetic to our weaknesses. He knew that 2,000 years later, we would need to be reminded on a regular basis of his sacrifice. And so he gave us the bread. And he said, look at that unleavened bread. It's pierced the way that my hands and feet and side and skull are all pierced. It's striped the way that the torturer's whip striped my back again and again and again. It's dry because when the guard stabbed me in the side, the blood and the water ran out and fell on the ground. Not a bone was broken, but make no mistake, Jesus' body was broken in every way possible for us. His blood poured out, not just covering our sins, but erasing our sins. On the cross, Jesus impoverished himself, made himself even poorer, that we might be eternally rich. And he gave us the bread and the cup so that we would go back to that place, so that we would remember that sacrifice. So that transaction that happened Jesus taking all of our sin and imputing to us all of his righteousness would again become real. He gave it to us because 2,000 years later, we still need to be encouraged to pause and remember that and then to consider what's our response to so great a love. Let's partake together.